Hey everyone, Mike Burke here with InsideRealEstatePhotography.com and in this video I'm going to go over my camera settings for HDR real estate photography, flash or flambient real estate photography, my camera settings for shooting real estate videos, and also how I program my custom slots and custom buttons on the camera. So I've gotten quite a few requests for a video dedicated to camera settings, so I hope this video helps a lot of you guys out there. Also, like I said, I'm gonna go over how I program my custom buttons and custom slots on the camera, which helps you quickly access certain settings in the camera and really helps speed up your workflow. For this demonstration, I'm gonna be using the Sony a7S III, which is my main real estate photography camera. I also have the a7 III, which is what I'm shooting this video on, but I thought I'd use the a7S III because it has the new Sony menu system in it, as all new Sony cameras will have over the next coming years, such as the a7 IV that just came out, the a7R IV, and all the new Sony cameras are gonna have this new menu system in it. So I thought that would be more relevant and keep this video relevant over the next few years. But if you have an older Sony camera, such as the a7 III or whatever, all these settings are there, they just might be in different spots. Or if you have another brand of camera, again, all these settings are there, you just might have to look for them in different spots. All right, so without further ado, let's jump into these settings. If you're wondering what this is, this is just my external video recorder so I can record the screen of my camera and show you the menu system and all the settings that I'm gonna be talking about throughout this video. All right, so the first thing we're gonna get into is my HDR camera settings for real estate photography. All right, so the first thing we're gonna do is turn the top dial on the camera to the A position, which is aperture priority mode. The reason I use aperture priority mode is because it makes it a little bit faster than manual mode because we don't have to set our shutter speed for every individual shot. The camera will automatically calculate the shutter speed, so it just speeds things up a little bit. All right, so the next thing I'm gonna do is simply change my aperture on the camera, which is typically done by this front dial on Sony cameras, but if you have a crop sensor out of like the A6000 series, this is different. But again, just change your aperture to F8, F8 is the aperture that I shoot all my interior and exterior real estate images for HDR photography. So the next thing I'm gonna set is my ISO. So I'm gonna set my ISO to 400. Now you might be wondering why are you shooting at 400 and not 100? 100 will give you a cleaner image. And yes, that's technically true, but 400 speeds things up a little bit because it'll speed up your shutter speed and your exposures won't take as long to make, so it helps you get in and out of a house faster. And I see no perceptible difference between 400 and 100. I've tested this out. And on a full frame camera like this or the a7 III, no problem. If you're on a crop sensor camera, like the a6000 series cameras or another brand crop sensor camera, APS-C size sensor, I would probably recommend going with 100 because those have a lot less tolerance for noise. So you might be able to pick up some noise at 400, I don't know. But uh, for me, 400 is fine. Again, there's no perceptible difference as far as I'm concerned. All right, so the next thing we wanna set is our drive mode. Since we're talking about doing HDR real estate photography here, we want the camera to shoot multiple exposures or brackets, which will later on be blended together in post-processing to create one final high dynamic range image. All right, so how we access the drive mode menu quickly is by pressing the left on the wheel on the back of the camera. Also, of course, you can access this through the internal menu of the camera. And I'm just gonna go down here to bracket continuous, and I'm just gonna scroll left or right here until I get to 2.0 EV5. So 2.0 EV5, which means we're gonna shoot five brackets or five exposures, two stops apart. All right, so next let's set our white balance. You can quickly access white balance by the little FN button on the back of the camera. Also, I use a custom button for this, which we'll get to later in this video, but you can quickly access it through there again, or internally through the menu of the camera. And once you get the white balance menu up, I'm just gonna put it on auto white balance. Auto works fine for me 99% of the time. If you're in a situation where it's just way off, then of course you can just go in and use manual to dial it in manually. All right, now let's talk about focus settings. Again, this is something you can quickly access via the FN button on back of the camera, or even quicker if you use a custom button, which I do, and I'll get to that again later in this video. So hitting the FN button, I'm gonna go to focus area, and I like to set that to wide. 99% of the time, wide works just fine, but if I am having a problem, I'll set it to spot or flexible spot so I can pinpoint my focus area and nail my focus. All right, now let's talk about our image ratio size. If I hit the menu button here on the camera and go down to the shooting menu, the first one is image quality, and in there you'll find aspect ratio. 
and I set mine to three to two aspect ratio. This is the preferred ratio to me. The other one is four to three, which is more squarish looking. Three to two is more of the standard, so I definitely recommend having your camera set to three to two ratio. All right, so the next thing we want to address is in the same image quality menu here. I'm just gonna go up to file format. I'm gonna set this to raw. Raw will give you the most flexibility, obviously, in post-processing. All right, so the next thing we're gonna set is our remote control settings. If you're using a little infrared remote that I use typically, you're gonna to need to set the camera to be able to receive an infrared signal. So how do you do that is if you go down to the settings menu, which is the little toolbox, the setup menu, and you go all the way down in this to setup option, and you'll see the function for IR remote control. And you just wanna set that to on. Again, that will allow the camera to receive an infrared signal so you can fire off your camera remotely without touching it. Again, this is something I recommend so you're not touching the shutter button. You might jiggle the camera and your brackets may not line up later in post-processing, which will give you a problem and a headache. Some other remotes are Bluetooth operated like the Sony Commander remote, which is more expensive, but has better range and you don't need to be so close to it to receive an infrared signal. So if you're doing like Flambian or flash photography, sometimes you have to be across a room to fire it off. So I would recommend a Bluetooth remote in that situation. So how you would turn that on is if you go up to the network menu, you would first go down to Bluetooth and then Bluetooth function, you would just turn that on. And then, then you would go up to transfer slash remote and go to Bluetooth remote control. And then you would turn that function on as well. One other setting real quick is if you go back down to the setup menu and you go to finder slash monitor and you go to select finder monitor, you would just select monitor always on. It won't let me do it right now because I'm connected to an external monitor, but that will just have your back screen all the time because that's what you're gonna be using for real estate photography. You're not ever gonna be really using the eyepiece unless it's like super sunny out or something and you can't see your screen. But having the back screen on all the time just disables the sensor that switches back and forth between the eyepiece. Cause if you put your hand back there or anything, it'll turn the, the screen off because there's a sensor there. It's just a pain in the butt, so it's nice to have it off. Okay, so another setting that I find very helpful as well is if you go back up to the shooting menu and you go all the way down to shooting display, grid line display, I have that on, and grid line type, rule of thirds grid. That'll just put the rule of thirds grid onto your screen, which will help you compose your shots. It doesn't show up in your final image or anything. It's just there to help you compose your shots. It'll show you where the center of your frame is, the left and the right side. I find it super helpful when, for when I'm composing my shots, it makes my shots better. So I definitely recommend having that on as well. One final setting for these HDR real estate photography settings is that we want our in-camera level to be on our screen. We want our shots to be level. This is an essential thing for real estate photography. We want our verticals to be straight and all of that. So it's a very important function. So to get that up, we hit the display button, which is the top of the wheel. We just press that multiple times until you see the level pop up. And I just leave that on my screen at all times. It's there. It gets you into the ballpark. It's not like 100% accurate. So even though it might say your level, you may not be, you may be off by a little bit. You gotta use your eyes and look at the scene and make sure your verticals look straight. And so don't rely on this 100%, but it's there to help you. It's a nice guide and gets you into the ballpark. All right, so now let's go over my flash or flambient real estate photography settings. A lot of these settings are in the camera are the same as the HDR settings. So I'm not gonna go over all of those again because that would just be redundant. I'm just gonna show you what's different. All right, so the first thing we're gonna do is change our top dial to M or manual mode. We wanna be able to change our shutter speed independently, which we can't do in aperture priority mode. We wanna be able to do all our settings independently. So that's why we want it in manual mode for flash photography. All right, so the next thing we're gonna change really quick is our aperture. We're gonna change it to F7.1. That's where I find is a nice sweet spot for flambient photography. So that's where I keep my aperture set. As far as shutter speed goes, it doesn't matter what it's really set at right now because that's the setting we're gonna be changing mostly to make our exposure correct for flambient photography. The next setting we wanna change for flambient photography is we wanna change our drive mode. We're not shooting brackets here. So I'm gonna to go to the drive mode menu again. I'm gonna go up to single shooting. We just wanna shoot single frames for flambient photography. So that's the setting we want it to be on. All right, so that's really all the settings that I changed for flambient flash real estate photography. Some things you might wanna consider though are focus. I do use autofocus on wide and seems to do me just fine usually, but if I notice an issue, sometimes I'll use manual because you are taking individual shots. So you're gonna be refocusing for your ambient shot then focusing again for your flash shot. So if your camera's focusing each time, just picking out whatever it wants to focus on. Maybe there'll be a focus issue between your frames. Again, not something I really experience, 
But to ensure that doesn't happen, you can use manual focus or use a flexible spot and just use a pinpoint focus on something particular in the room to avoid those issues. Another thing you may wanna consider is manually doing your white balance. I use auto most of the time. For me, it does fine. Again, this is something you can tweak in post. We're shooting in raw, so not that big of a deal. But if you want it to be consistent between frames, if you're having any issues with that, manual white balance is something you might wanna consider. All right guys, so now let's talk about real estate video settings. The first thing we're gonna do is change the dial to video mode to the film strip on the dial up here. And now we can set our video settings. Now let's go into the menu and set a few settings on how we want the video to be recorded. So I'm gonna hit the menu button, go down to the shooting menu. First here we have image quality, then I'm gonna to go to file format. Now here's where things are gonna get different depending on what kind of camera you have. Every camera has different video recording capabilities. Here on the A7S III, I record in file format XAVCS. Most Sony's I recommend XAVCS, no matter if you're doing 4K or HD. I'm going to do 4K because I can do that on this camera. And for movie settings, going down one notch here, I want to go to record frame rate. I like to record my videos in 120p, 120 frames per second. And then on record setting, I'm going to go to 280 megs, 422 10-bit color. So these are the highest quality recording settings that I can get out of this camera. Now, this is kind of unique to this camera. Most cameras out there can't shoot 4K 120 or 4K 60 even, a lot of cameras can't do. So what I recommend you do is if you, you need to shoot in a higher frame rate, the, the reason for shooting in a higher frame rate is so we can convert it to slow motion later on in post-processing, which slows the footage down, gives it a more graceful feel, a more smooth feel. So I highly recommend either 60 or 120 frames per second. I shoot in both sometimes, but my preference has been 120 lately, so that's why I shoot in 4K 120 on this camera. If you can't shoot in 4K 120 frames per second or even 4K 60 frames per second, which a lot of cameras can't even do yet this day and age, a lot of them are starting to be able to do that, I would just recommend shooting in 1920 by 1080 HD in either 60 or 120 frames per second. So whatever your camera's capable of, I like shooting in 4K 120 because it's the highest quality I can get here, but shoot whatever the highest quality you can get is. I output all my videos in HD at the end and deliver to clients that way. But I like the flexibility of 4K. The quality is better even though it's gonna be output in HD. And also it gives you the ability since it's higher resolution that you can crop in on some images and reframe them, recompose them. So it just gives you more flexibility shooting in 4K as well. So that's, that's another advantage of shooting in 4K. So now that you've chosen your video settings in regard to resolution and frame rate, again, depending on the capabilities of your particular camera, the next thing I wanna talk about is shutter speed. So as a general rule of thumb, when it comes to setting shutter speed for video recording, you want your shutter speed to be basically double what your frame rate is to achieve the most natural looking motion. So for instance, if you're shooting at 60 frames per second, you wanna set your shutter speed to be one 1 25th of a second, cause that's basically double of 60. And if you're shooting 120 frames per second, then you want your shutter speed to be one 2 50th of a second, because that's basically double of 120. I do break the rule a little bit here. As I said, I like to shoot at 4K 120 frames per second. So I should be using one 2 50th of a second, but I'm gonna set my shutter speed to one 1 25th of a second. I like to let as much light in as possible. This will give us more light because shooting interior video for real estate, it's dark and you need every edge you can get. And I've not noticed any issues at shooting one 1 25th of a second at 120 frames per second. There's not a lot of motion going on. So if you're doing fast motion, it might be an issue, but we're not doing that. We're kind of doing slow, graceful moves. So it's not really an issue and I've never noticed a problem. Now when it comes to aperture and ISO, those are the two things you're gonna be using to adjust your exposure depending on the scene. But by default, I like to have my f-stop all the way open on this lens that's f2.8. That might be different on the lens you're using. And ISO, I'm just gonna put it down to 100 for now. Typically when I'm shooting the interior of a house, I have my f-stop all the way open at f2.8. I'm just using ISO to adjust my exposure because the light is that dim inside of the house that my f-stop is gonna be all the way open. So I can keep the ISO as low as possible because I'm already letting as most light as I can with my f-stop. So I'm just gonna adjust my ISO as necessary to make my exposure correct. Now let's talk about a few other settings. I'm gonna go into the menu here. I'm gonna to go to focus mode. I'm gonna set that to manual focus. I strictly use manual focus for all my shots while shooting real estate videos because otherwise you're gonna get focus hunting where the camera doesn't know what to focus on. Depending on objects you're passing that are closer to the camera, it just, it's a mess, trust me, it'll ruin your shots. Just stick to manual focus. 
All right, so the other thing I'm gonna change here in the menu is I'm gonna to go to white balance. I'm gonna take it off auto. I'm gonna put it on manual Kelvin white balance, which you can change the color temperature to whatever you want. Again, I manually adjust the white balance as I do the manual focus for every shot that I do in a video. I take a look at the scene and see what it looks like to my naked eye. Then I look at the screen and adjust the Kelvin temperature to get it to be as close as what I'm seeing with my eyes as I can. All right, so another thing I'm gonna adjust here in the menu is picture profile. I'm gonna to go to picture profile. I'm gonna put it on PP1. PP1 is just a general movie recording profile that looks pretty good just straight out of camera. You don't have to do too much color grading or color corrections or adjusting afterwards and post. And I definitely recommend, especially if you're just starting out, to use a profile like that so you're not having to worry about all these adjustments you're gonna to have to make after the fact. You could, of course, use what's called a log profile. For Sony's, that's called S-Log, or for Canon, it's called C-Log. And that gives you more dynamic range, which is great, but there's more work to be done in post-production with color grading the image. It just looks like a gray washed out image when you shoot it. It's also harder to shoot, so there's some advantages to it, but it's also more difficult to work with. So, you know, it's up to you whether you wanna to try to experiment with that. That's definitely something I'm gonna get into in another video in the future down the road. All right guys, so that's pretty much it as far as settings go that I use for recording real estate videos. So the second light in my studio just went out. So if this looks a little bit different now, I'm sorry, but I'm just gonna trudge on here and we're gonna finish this video. All right, so the next thing I wanna talk about is custom slots. And that's on the dial of your camera up here. I have three on this camera, on the a7 III, it has two custom slots. But what's great about custom slots is that you can save all these settings that we just talked about into one of these slots so you can quickly recall them. So you don't have to dial in all these settings every time you go to do a shoot. So how you would do this, you would just set up your camera exactly how you want it to be with all your settings. For instance, all the video settings we just did in the last section. And if you wanted to save those into one of the custom slots, you would just hit the menu button, go down to the shooting menu, Go down to shooting mode, and then I'm gonna to go to MR camera set memory. And here you'll see your one, two, three slots here, and you can save these settings to any slot you want. I'm gonna to go to slot number three and just hit okay and see it registered those settings. So say you were at a shoot, you just finished shooting photos and now you're ready to shoot a video. All I would have to do is turn my dial to slot number three, it would pull up all my video settings and I'd be ready to go in an instant. This is a huge advantage and a huge convenience. This is such a great little tool. I highly recommend you take advantage of your custom slots on your dial. So say you had three custom slots on your dial like I do on this camera. You could save HDR settings in slot number one, Flambient settings in slot number two, and your video settings in slot number three. And you could just quickly access them all day long by using those custom slots. It saves you a ton of time and you're not dialing in settings all day long trying to change them and remember which settings are what and it gets confusing and overwhelming. This just makes everything so much simpler and so much easier. The last thing I wanna talk about in this video is custom buttons. Most cameras have custom buttons that you can program to be whatever you want. Sony's in particular are very highly customizable. There is a bunch of custom buttons on them already, but even the buttons that are pre-programmed by Sony, you can change them to be whatever you want. So you can change it to really suit your needs and be able to pull up things in the menu instantly by pressing a button instead of digging through the menu to find them. So just, again, it just makes things so much faster and more convenient and suit your needs perfectly. All right, so how you would go about changing these and programming these buttons, if you go into the menu and you go down to the setup menu and you go to operation customize, you'll see custom key settings. What's nice here is you'll see photo custom key settings and video custom key settings. So depending on what mode you are, you can have custom buttons when you're in photo mode to be completely different than those when you're in video mode. So again, that's awesome because you may not be using the same buttons for certain things in photo and video mode. So it allows you to customize the buttons for both modes individually. So if you click on this in the menu, you'll see it'll highlight the button on the right and it'll show you what it's programmed to be. So if you just wanna change it to anything, you would just click on that and then it would allow you to go through the menu and pick out the, th the thing or the item in the menu that you want to pull up. It literally can be almost anything. So again, this is highly customizable and highly personal to you. All right, I'll go over some of the custom buttons that I use really quick on mine for photo mode. I have a white balance one in order to quickly change to manual white balance if I need to. Focus mode to change it from wide focus mode to maybe a flexible spot if my autofocus is not behaving the way I want to. Those are some quick examples. For video mode, I have a lot more like, I program the back wheel just to be ISO because I'm constantly changing ISO to adjust my exposure for interior video. I have a white balance one for that. I have a focus magnifier one which will punch in so I can focus 
on something, an object to make sure I'm in focus. I have a focus peaking one. Focus peaking just outlines things in a color so you know what's in focus and what's not. So again, it's personal to you. Whatever you need to access or you find that you need to access quickly all the time, settings that you're constantly changing, you can program them to be a custom button. It saves you a lot of time. It's really convenient. It's fantastic. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed this video on camera settings. If you did, please hit the like button and subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. I really appreciate your support. Thanks so much for watching this video, and I'll see you again soon on the next one.